So you may be familiar with this book. Uh, I think we've got a picture on the screen if you can't see this. Uh, the Place is Your Go by Dr. Seuss. Um, it's usually given to high school students once they finish with, uh, with high school as they enter into the big wide adult world. And it takes the reader on this whimsical journey um, through ups and downs and the twists and turns of life. And uh, one of these places that it speaks about in this book is called The Waiting Place. And uh, I want to read a, an excerpt from it. I had my version, it's a little bit smaller than this, but my niece Scarlett gave me hers, and the font is a lot bigger, so I thought I'll use this one. So thank you, Scully. I'm going to do my prepared reading. I hope I, I hope I do you proud. So what is the waiting place, according to Dr. Seuss? For people, just waiting. And what are they waiting for? They're waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow or waiting around for a yes or a no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting, waiting for the fish to bite. Nico, I don't know if you're here this morning. He likes to wait for the fish to bite. Waiting for wind to fly a cart, or waiting around for a Friday night, or waiting, perhaps, for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. And most of us can identify with one or two scenarios in that description, or maybe you're thinking of a specific situation in your life. Maybe you'll identify with some of these. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a go. I'm going to make some suggestions, Dr. Seuss style. Perhaps you're waiting for your visa or passport to come, or waiting for school to be done. Hey, Bryce. <laughs> or for a building to be built, or to be free from guilt, or waiting for payday, or to move away, Lexi and Rota, or to have your say, or waiting perhaps, for your children to be better behaved, or for your loved one to be saved. Yeah. So the bottom line is that we are all waiting for something in one way or another. And Dr. Seuss's description is very funny because a lot of it is true. But the one thing that he says about the waiting place is that it's useless. And then he says, it's not for you. And then he predicts that somehow you will escape all this waiting and staying, and you'll find bright places where boom bands are playing. And sure, while some types of waiting feel useless to us, the waiting place is one of the key places in our Christian walk and in our Christian journey. Whether we want to accept it or not, and most of us don't like it, but despite thinking that we can find some way to avoid it or escape it, most of us sitting here this morning know that we can't. And waiting is not easy, and it's not enjoyable. Uh, the Christian musician Lincoln Brewster, he wrote a song called While I Wait, in 2018, and um, it's become quite a special song to us, especially as we're going through this building project and there's a lot of waiting. We like to call them divine delays, you know, because we're spiritual like that. <laughs> and, um, but Lincoln Brewster didn't write the song while he was going through a building project. He wrote it during a time, a much, much more serious time. His wife was severely ill with uh, a very rare form of cancer. And uh, he wrote this song to worship God in the waiting while they were waiting for a miracle. And he said, 
that there is such meaning to be found in the pain of waiting. And sometimes we will look back after a time of waiting and we will understand why we had to wait, but sometimes we'll never know. We'll never know why we had to wait. But he says this. He says, I do know that God doesn't waste the wait. God does not waste the wait. And so his song is his testimony about worshipping God in the pain of the waiting place while they were waiting for a miracle. And I believe that he's challenging and encouraging us to do the same today. So God gave him a new song of praise in his time of waiting. But thousands of years before Dr. Seuss wrote his book, and thousands of years before Lincoln Brewster wrote his song, there was another song about the waiting place, a beautiful song, very emotive, very poetic, with rhythm and with rhyme, and it was written by another musician and poet. Can you guess who it was? You're not allowed to say it's Winnie because he knows. And Dean. Dean's not allowed to say So who, who was it? Who wrote it? Yes, guys. Well done. Well done. Very clever, too. And so this morning I'd like to explore David's wisdom as he encourages and challenges us to embrace rather than escape the waiting place, which can be very meaningful rather than useless. So David has some things to tell us about waiting well. And so if it's okay, can we have a look at them? Let's turn to uh, Psalm 40. Uh, please, uh, it will be on the, on the screen. But a psalm is actually a sacred uh, song or a poem, or it's a prayer that is sung. That's what a psalm means. And this particular psalm, Psalm 40, I didn't tell you where to turn, did I? Psalm 40, it explores the themes of deliverance, and it explores themes of gratitude, and the importance of worshipping and obeying and trusting God. And we're just going to focus on the first three verses this morning. Just Psalm 40, verse, verses 1 to 3. For the choir director, a psalm of David, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. So David starts off by saying he waited patiently for the Lord. But let's have a look at the reason behind why he was waiting patiently for the Lord. He says he was in a pit of despair in his life. And the King James Version refers to it as a horrible pit. And this pit that David is referring to is, is like, a, it's like a cistern or a reservoir or a well. And it's mostly empty, but it's got just enough water at the bottom to be muddy. And these pits or these wells were often used to confine someone or to trap them. And uh, the prophet Jeremiah, he was thrown into a pit like this. Uh, he, God had told him to prophesy to the people, and they didn't like what he was saying. And so they decided he, need to go, he needed to go into the pit to die. And then the story of Joseph, uh, his jealous brothers, they also threw him into a similar pit. So this is the kind of pit that David is referring to. And this, this picture that David is trying to paint for us of being trapped in, in very dark circumstances, is it's like you're trying to get a foothold to get out, but you keep on slipping and you you sink lower and lower and deeper and deeper into this slimy mud. 
And John Piper points out that if we study the Hebrew words, there are actually two images that will emerge that David is trying to, to get across here. The one is of a, a muddy pit, but the other one is it's a type of roaring flood, almost like ocean waves in a storm. So there's a picture of mud and flood. And David doesn't tell us the reason why he's in this pit of despair. There are many different theories that uh, theologians have come up, but he doesn't refer specifically to a particular situation, so we can't be certain. But if we look at this picture that David is painting for us in the light of mankind's uh, state of sin that we were in and Jesus' salvation, then it paints a picture for us of how we were trapped in our sin, and we were not able to do anything in our own strength to get out of that, pin, that pit of sin and death. And so Jesus came along, and his death and his resurrection lifted us out of that pit of sin and death. So we could look at it in the light of, of sin and salvation, but maybe you relate to this pit that David is talking about simply because of the, the demands and the troubles and the expectations of life that are pulling you down, that are overwhelming you, that are perhaps making you feel helpless and, and hopeless. Just like David, you're also waiting and you're wanting God to come through for you, to break through into your situation. Maybe you don't feel that you're necessarily in a dark pit, um, but you're in a weird space or place in your life where you feel a bit confined. Daryl spoke about being confined. And it's uncomfortable, and it's unpleasant, and it's uncertain. And you also are wanting some div divine discernment or some form of deliverance from God, direction from him. And so what can we learn about this desperate state that David was in? What, what did he do? Let's remind ourselves. He says, I waited. Mm. It's not exactly the answer we were looking for, is it? And not only did he wait, but how did he wait? He says, I waited patiently. Now we definitely don't like what he has to say, because that's hard. It's hard enough to wait, but to wait patiently, oh, it's like a bit of a tall order. Because if many of us are honest, we actually agree with Dr. Seuss, don't we? Yeah. Well, the waiting place is not for me, and I'm going to try, and I'm going to escape the waiting place, because there's no deliverance, there's no action, and so what's the use? It's not a place to enjoy. We just want those bright places that Dr. Dr. Seuss talks about. Remember the story of Abraham and Sarah. Uh, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. But at the time that God gave him that promise, he and Sarah were actually childless. And after waiting for a very long time, a time goes by and it goes by and there's nothing happening, Abraham and Sarah try and take matters into their own hands. They try and escape the waiting place. And Abraham fathers a son with Hagar, who was Sarah's handmaiden, and Ishmael was born. But that wasn't God's plan. God was gracious enough to still bless Ishmael, but God's plan was for Isaac to step into the covenant as Abraham's heir, which eventually did happen 25 years later. So Abraham and Sarah tried to escape the waiting place. And I'm not saying that we must do nothing while we wait. David wasn't passive in his waiting. He persevered. Uh, and he was expectant, and he worshipped while he waited. He endured while he waited. And when I think of that word endured, I can't help but think of 
the Duracell Bunny. I don't know if you remember the Duracell Bunny advert. Yeah, I'm not, maybe I'm showing my age, yeah? Like from the late 70s, you know, early 80s. But uh, in this ad, for those of you who are not familiar with it, there's this group of pink bunnies with their drums, as you can see, and they're all banging their drums all happy and enthusiastically, and then slowly their batteries start dying, and then they just come to a, a stop, except for that one bunny, because he has Duracell batteries, and so his batteries last and last and last. And so for those of you sitting there thinking, it's not the Duracell bunny, it's the Energizer bunny. <laughs> Energizer actually stole the idea from Duracell. And I know this because I went down a rabbit hole on this one <laughs> while I was busy researching this. And then I had to rein myself back because I was reading about marketing strategies and lawsuits and, you know, I can squirrel a bit. I'm a bit like Dory. Um, <laughs> But how many of us can say we are like that Jerusalem bunny in a time of waiting, where we have that endurance to keep going, you know? And I'm not saying we have to be all upbeat, no pun intended, but uh, maybe we all start off waiting, you know? we praising God, and we praying up a storm, and we trusting Him, and we testifying about His goodness, and then... Time goes by one day after the next, and weeks go by and months go by, and we just run out of steam and we give up and we do our own thing in the end because we just get tired of waiting. And that's often because we're relying on our own power, our own strength in the waiting instead of the Holy Spirit's power. We have to change our batteries. That's how we can have endurance. But we just want everything to be fast. You know, nowadays we live in this fast paced world where it's all about speed and productivity. And, you know, the Wi Fi must be fast and the food must be fast and decisions must be made fast. You know, we don't, we don't like to wait. And when we are waiting, um, yeah, we get impatient. We don't have that dependent, hopeful endurance that David is talking about in the waiting. You know, we want it to be a 100-meter dash. Yeah. You know, let's get this over and done with. You feel like you've got stamina, but for 100 meters, no more. But actually, the waiting place is more like one of those grueling ultra-marathons. You know, some of us know a little bit about it. I went down another rabbit hole about grueling ultra-marathons. I found out there's one... 5,000 kilometers over 52 days. And it starts, it's between 6 a.m. and midnight every day for 52 days until you've done 5,000 kilometers. What? Then there's another one. It's 322 kilometers. But the catch is this. It's all in underground tunnels. That's got to mess with your head. But when it comes to waiting, we need to be more like long-distance athletes than sprinters or escape artists. Because why? God, God doesn't waste the waiting. He doesn't waste the waiting. Firstly, he's doing something in us in the waiting. The Holy Spirit is busy transforming us into the likeness of Jesus and that is a slow process, and it can be painful, but that is because the Spirit is busy doing deep work within us. And God doesn't waste our waiting, secondly, because He is going to do something through us. And let's see what, what God did in and through David during his time of waiting. So he says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. And so God turned to David, and he heard his cry. And actually the picture that is painted for us here is of God bending down and listening to David 
we read something similar in Psalm 116. It says, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my prayer for mercy. Because he bends down to listen, I will pray as long as I have breath. And so God actually bends down and he listens to David and then he lifts him up out of this pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire, and he sets his feet on solid ground and he steadies him. And so before, where David felt like he was in this slippery mud, he's on solid ground. And before, where he felt like he was stagnant and sinking, his steps are now steady. And then David says, He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. So God gave David this new song of praise to God, not just a new song. It was a new song of praise to God. And I'm sure you'll agree, it's easier to worship God after we've come through the waiting place. It's much more difficult to worship God in the waiting place especially when the waiting has been long and you're weary and you've, you've had to endure and you start getting despondent and disillusioned and desperate. And sometimes we're so focused on being out of the waiting place or through the waiting place that we're not present in the waiting place to be aware of what God is doing in us. And sometimes we see waiting as a punishment instead of a process where the Spirit is working in us. And worshiping God while we are in, are in the waiting place gives us a completely different perspective because our eyes lift off of ourselves onto Him and we become aware of how great and majestic and how powerful He is. And another thing, another beautiful thing that will happen in the waiting place if you worship is that you will become aware of God's presence. And sometimes, most times, that is enough. Just to be aware of his presence. When When we are in the waiting place, worship is one of the best things that we can do. Actually, the best thing that we can do. And worship can be many things. It can be singing. It can just be lifting your hands, just stretching them out if that's all you can manage. It can be kneeling. It can be lying flat on your face. It can even be serving. We can worship God through serving. That's a form of worship. Another form of worship is weeping. Sometimes all we have are tears. We can offer them as worship to God. And as we sing songs of gratitude, we slowly feel that our attitude adjusts and our spirits lift. And in our times of waiting, regardless of the outcome, God will give us a new song and he will give us a new story to tell of his faithfulness and his greatness in our lives, just like David did. And then what did God do through David? in this time of waiting. It says in the second part of verse 3, it says, many will see what he, and that is God, many will see what God has done and be amazed. And what will they do? They will put their trust in the Lord. And so in David's waiting place, his song was his testimony of what God had done in him and what God had done for him. And people were able to see God's greatness as David went through this process. And not only did they observe, they were amazed. They were in awe. And not only were they in awe, but they were drawn to this God that David served. And they too then put their trust in that same God. And so friends... God has a much bigger purpose in our waiting place than just us. But maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've been waiting 
and waiting and waiting, and you've really tried to wait well, but you haven't got what you hoped for. And that's tough. But if the Apostle Paul was with us this morning, I believe that he would tell us that he knows what it feels like to keep asking and to keep waiting to be delivered from something, especially something painful. In 2 Corinthians 12, we read about a tormenting thorn in Paul's flesh that he wanted God to take from him. And this thorn in his flesh was a source of pain in his life. And again, we don't know exactly what it was. There are some theories. Uh, some people will say it, it was a health issue or a disability. Uh, other people will even say it was a person that was particularly painful in his life. But we don't know. But Paul had asked God three times to take it away from him, and God didn't take it away from him because he wanted to use it for a person, a purpose. And all God said to Paul, and maybe that's what God is saying to us this morning, is my grace is all you need. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And so when we are weak and when we are weary in the waiting, we know that God's grace is sufficient for us. And we can experience his power and his presence as we wait. And ultimately, God is the one who is glorified. And so we can either fight the waiting place and we can try and escape it, or we can encounter God and his love and his comfort and his presence as he bends down to listen to us. And as we rely on his grace and as we truly surrender and we patiently cooperate with the deep work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and through us, perhaps could we? Start welcoming waiting places. Not because of what happens to us there, as great as what that is. It's not because of what happens in us and through us. But it's more about who is with us in the waiting place. Because we are not alone. And so may we say, like David said in one of his other Psalms, Psalm 62, verse 5, Let all that I am let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in Him. Not in the outcome, not in my circumstances. My hope is in Him. And the message paraphrase says this, God, the one and only, I'll wait as long as He says. Everything I hope for comes from Him, so why not? He is solid rock under my feet, and he is breathing room for my soul. So even though we may feel we are in a confined space, with him our souls can breathe. And so I'd like to take a moment this morning, I'd like to play that song by Lincoln Brewster for you, and just to trust that as we listen to the song, as we read the lyrics, that God would speak to you in your unique situation, your unique waiting place, whatever that looks like for you. Mm -hmm. 